Testing, testing. Legends ultimate. Our community and, um, you know, also affects the world because, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people suffering from bad drug regulation policies because of that. I think this is going to be a good conversation between uh, David and then Robert and Alana, who have a lot to say about this. So, Excellent. David, hand it over. Thank you very much. I'm doing double duty. So welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, happy to chair this session. I'll add a little bit of flavor, too, but we've got some great minds here. And I want to be a little bit interactive, because you all have stories to tell as well about people who have suffered the consequences of legalization. I'd like to come out of, come out of it with some hope. Uh, at the end, uh, but um, but this session will be a little heavier than the last one, but uh, looking forward to the conversation. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists, just before we get into the question, just to give a little introduction of themselves. I know they're well known to many, um, but uh, some folks are here for the first time. So even in the back, um, we've got some incredible uh, brains here in the cannabis sector. We've got um, just tremendous experience here on the stage, and we should really uh, take advantage of it. So I'm going to ask uh, each of you, Nana, maybe you can go first and give a little bit of an introduction before we go straight to the question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. Nice to see everyone here. It's my first Unicorn uh, Music Festival, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Alana Davis. I have a family farm in Duncan on Vancouver Island. So we're here for a long drive, and it's been awesome. First time in the Kootenays. And so uh, my family farm is an outdoor cultivation and recently processing facility where we cultivate and process our product into live rosin. And uh, we also are moving into the cannabis tourism sector with a bed and breakfast, a private lake on our farm. Uh, not as big as nice as this one here, but uh, pretty good, I will say. And so also with the element of cannabis tours and um, eventually a farm gate uh, store and hopefully general store, dab lounge, the whole the whole nine. So I'm really excited to chat about this as kind of a unique perspective, I guess. A lot of you are legacy growers and uh, makers, and I am in fact not that. I am a, life li a lifelong consumer and enjoyer of cannabis, and uh, it's a passion of mine, but uh, my journey in cannabis began at legalization, and so it's a bit of an interesting perspective, hopefully, to bring to the table, and uh, we'll chat about that soon. Thank you. Um, I'm Rob Laurie, Ad Lucent Law Corporation. First, let me start by saying it's an absolute honor to be in the Kootenay. So thank you for making me feel so welcome and uh, a real honor to be up here talking about important issues as uh, the impacts of legalization. Well, I guess for me, my, inter my interaction with cannabis was quite unique. My younger brother's best friend was Seth Rogen's dealer for seven and a half years. And so for me, I wanted to go to law school because I saw people that were going to jail for a, a plant and medicine. And to me, that just seemed very absurd. So fast forward, you know, 30 years, I run a legal practice where I pretty much exclusively deal in issues involving cannabis, psychedelics, and more recently, uh, First Nations and Indigenous issues surrounding cannabis. So it's, it's been an interesting ride, and uh, I'm excited to share, share my thoughts as we progress this dialogue. And I'll turn it back over to David. Thanks very much, Rob. 
great panel. Thanks for the, and I just congrats to you on your operation on the island. It is like the poster child of uh, cannabis tourism in Canada. So just kudos to you. It's just uh, encourage everybody to, to look that up and uh, try and experience that. Okay, so the topic, as we said, the consequences of legalization uh, of cannabis in Canada. We all know people, many of us are affected. I think we all um, are having some level of PTSD with regards to how things have gone uh, over the past five years. So it's not a bad time to take a look uh, five years uh, into legalization coming up in October. There's a lot going on. And as I said earlier, I do want to make sure we get into the crowd uh, today. Um, before we get to uh, the question with the panel, uh, are there any police officers here? Anyone from law enforcement? The Law Society? No enforcement agencies? All right, great. I had to do that disclaimer for Rob. Rob is a lawyer, so he's not dispensing legal advice, but he is uh, here to help. So if you have hypothetical questions or theories or, or practical things, you can ask those questions uh, uh, here as well. And we're really thankful uh, for that, Rob. Appreciate it and all your advocacy that you've done. Um, okay. Uh, maybe... Alani, you'll have an interesting take on it because you came in with legalization. So I'll start with Rob first. And uh, uh, maybe, Rob, you can uh, give us some examples or some personal experiences of how um, the legalization of cannabis maybe has affected you personally, people you, you've known and had real consequences on their life. Thank you. Well, I think the greater consequences that impacted people were certainly before legalization. I mean, the one great thing about legalization is people aren't going to jail at the same frequency. You're not seeing the Ministry of Children and Family Development removing children from their families because of cannabis. So, you know, in, in many ways, I was in Mexico City last year, and there's a square little area that's called a cannabis amnesty and it's the only place you can consume cannabis without any kind of repercussions or consequences and I proudly smoke weed pretty much anywhere I go but Mexico City you know being a big gringo downtown not the best idea so what's great about legalization at least is in Canada you can be open and transparent you can access materials and um, cannabis that's you know safe regulated trusted dosages, so that's all good. But I think what has failed us tremendously is, and John Conroy, if he was here, and you know, sadly, Mr. Conroy's had health issues, so he's not here, but his take has always been that we got to legalization because of reasonable, dignified patient access. And with the passage and legalization of cannabis, it almost seems like dignified patient rights and legal access in that regard went out the window everyone forgot how we got here and it's more been eyes on dollar signs and in an industry which i went to law school because the price of weed when i looked it up was 37 cents a pound in 1935 the year before the marijuana stamp act so either way you look at it cannabis is a commodity compared to corn sugar coffee or any of the others is so grossly overvalued so that i think has been a wake-up call to most people that the margins in legal cannabis are not forgiving like they were in the old days and you know having had friends that were large-scale growers like eight thousand lights some of my friends managed and in the old days you were really making a killing on just mediocre weed that would double in value across the border and then with the exchange rate there'd be an extra 15 20 percent based on the value and i mean now those those are i would say the golden days of cannabis of like you know when when the money just was there but shifting forward in legalization you really need to know what you're doing because the margins are not forgiving the competition is so abundant and you know how do you differentiate one pile of green product from another pile of green product which is very hard to create a market so it's been tough seeing people with all the best intentions and Alana can speak more to this but there's been families and business partners that have gone all in in the legal market with faith that this is going to be right and it hasn't there's been more people i've seen coming out of the hills disappointed they haven't found gold than there have been who struck it in in the big industries. so 
you know, I think the best days of the legal cannabis industry hopefully are still ahead of us, but there's a lot of work to get there. And I don't know, for me as a lawyer, there really hasn't been a bad day in cannabis because it's really been a revolving door of an opportunity to deal with you know, interesting problems across a spectrum of issues. And for a professional like me, I couldn't be more honored and appreciative to be in a place where I get to do this type of work every day. So on that note, let me hand it over to Alana. I certainly hope the best days are yet to come. <laughs> I have a, a bit of a different perspective because legalizing cannabis allowed me to pinpoint the passion that I was searching for for the, re the beginning of my life. I always wondered what it is I want to do with my life. I knew I wanted to work for myself and, you know, figure out a way to build my own path. And it was not until cannabis became on the horizon where I realized that that was something that was actually even a possibility. Um, and so when my dad decided to go down the path of creating a cannabis farm, I thought it was a pipe dream, but uh, here we are and uh, we have been managed to actually get across the line and get licensed and bring our brand to market. And throughout that process, I came clean about smoking weed to my parents and that has created, you know, uh, the most, mo much more authentic relationship and, you know, created a sense of connection with me and my parents that maybe didn't exist before because I was worried that they'd be mad that I was doing something illegal. It turns out they were also doing something illegal, so who, who knew? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it also allowed people like our grower Ross to um, not have to hide what he was doing anymore and be able to not worry, like you said, that his kids are going to get taken away from him, from him because he's got his medical plants growing in his in his grow and obviously there are so many businesses that have not been successful and that's really really sad and it's been very challenging to watch this industry um i was an, a part of one of the bigger businesses at the start which i say don't hold that against me because uh, i like to say some of those big businesses are like male cannabis plants where they don't grow flower for shit, but their seeds can do something amazing sometimes so i've met some really amazing people that came from those big cannabis brands because in the beginning that was the only people who were employers you know we all wanted to work in the legal weed industry because we thought that it was going to be this amazing thing it's all in the open now um and so in ways it's created connections and opportunity beyond my wildest dreams and I've found my passion and I've allowed it's allowed this all of us and all this connection and all this networking and business and opportunity and everything all these good times this actual relaxation that we get to have together that's all happened because we were you know people before us they fought for this and so there are definitely been some hard times and more hard times are coming, but it's also like Kelly from Dragonfly Earth Medicine said yesterday, we're individually a drop, but together we're a flood. And many of our foremothers and fathers got us here by some civil disobedience and uh, being very stubborn individuals. And those are the businesses that are going to succeed because you build a connection on your brand and you make real individual one-on-one -on -one connections with every customer and every retailer and you put love and intention into your product and you have the right strategy and you know what you want to do and you know what to do you will be successful and you have the right conviction and uh, I believe that uh, the cream rises to the crop um, to the top <laughs> so I mean there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot of challenges that have happened and many people who have not been able to make the transition and it is really really upsetting but I think that there is there is some silver linings that uh, we just got to look for them 
Big hand for our panel. Great opening uh, remarks. I really appreciate it. And I am going to come to the audience. So if you have some examples of consequences, I think it's important um, to share stories and so that people know they're not alone. I think that's one of the challenges that we find at the co-op. People really think they're alone and there is a, a family out there that's going through it. So it's good to share. Um, I'll start maybe with a quick question, a, an individual one for each of you. We've not rehearsed this in any way. Um, so Rob, you, you talked about, you know, business is good for lawyers, uh, which I appreciate you, the admission. W maybe comment a bit on the two or three legal, hot legal issues that you, th you know, we're here because of uh, uh, the courts uh, and the occasional uh, politician showing some leadership, but really that's it. So the courts, uh, even though it's legal, are still a very active place. So would you like to maybe give the folks a bit of a briefing on what you think are kind of the two or three kind of hot legal issues to watch related to cannabis, assuming there are some. Tons. Thank you. All right, that's a great question. So the way I look at it is there's always going to be a need for the courts because how we got to legalization, John Conroy calls it the litany of litigation, which is like a 15 year period from R.V. Parker through to Barron, up through then to Allard and Smith, and it's ongoing. And the way that worked was the government needed to effectively be frog marched through the courts toward this line of dignified patient access. And I think that is an area that, you know, the community was very joined on a lot of these earlier issues and was supportive and then legalization came and there isn't the same degree of, I guess, civil disobedience and activism like there, there used to be. And if anything, as a lawyer, I think there needs to be more of it because they make for great cases, but they also establish fact patterns, which when they go before the courts, um, illustrate, you know, f fallacies with the, with the drafting of the legislation. So pointing to some examples. So Kirk and Jack, if they were here, they'd be talking about the Victoria Cannabis Buyers Club case for sure. That's a huge case involving Ted Smith. Probably everyone here knows Ted in some way, but ultimately they're challenging the CSU. And I think this is an area that we could all agree that the CSU and much of the enforcement, is it really necessary under the guide of public health and public safety? Or is this more of what BC, especially the BC government, do really, really well, which is kind of create a rice bowl that they don't really allow anyone else to eat out of? And that's the interesting thing that we've seen in the legal market, that the BC government gets to directly compete with the private retailers. The BC government gets to, has the enforcement body of the CSU and the resources of the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General. So again, I think what I'd like to see more of is standing up because ultimately the CSU investigations are bullshit, for lack of a better word. And you know, the rhetoric frustrates me that they're there on education visits and they're making a safety visit and the RCMP attend along with them to ensure safety. And to me, it's like if cannabis was really this big of a boogeyman still, then why did they legalize it? So a lot of this, again, I think the government, BC government needs to be held account in this province because let's take the eight store limit. That is an issue that we're gonna challenge in our indigenous case. If the BC government as a government can have 36 stores, then the Songhees nation is limited to eight. Now, if the Songhees nation is a government, indigenous technically are our fourth level of government, if we are looking at issues such as UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and the repealing of traditional doctrines of discovery and terra nullis, then I, again, I think that there is a, a, a need to challenge many of these restrictions. And let me just sum up the other big issue, and we're going to talk more about this tomorrow, we'll have Corey Brew and other members of our Indigenous Charter Challenge, uh, which we're bringing. And, uh, that, that's going to be a big one to watch. I'll, I'll just give a little bit of an intro, but ultimately, Corey, with all the permissions of his nations and government, established the cannabis licensing laws for their nation. He opened three stores on reserve and created a not-for-profit to help facilitate other indigenous groups 
opening. Now you have to remember, indigenous participation in the drafting of the Cannabis Act, there was very little consultation, like I dare say any. But regardless, um, Corey decided to open up a store off reserve in downtown Vernon. Now downtown Vernon is traditional Okanagan Indian Band territory. And under the UNDRIP, which Canada implemented UNDRIP federally, and BC is the only province to implement DRIPA, provincially, we're, gonna, we're run, literally just running into the government with these arguments to ask the court for A, a declaration, and B, trying to determine and establish whether or not Aboriginal have what would be called a Section 35 existing Aboriginal right. And Indigenous selling weed out of a shop's a bit of a stretch, but the level that I'm looking at is the definition of cannabis in the Cannabis Act defines cannabis as f all phytocannabinoids identical to cannabis, and then you go down two lines, regardless of process. So technically an Indigenous who is making a coneflower tincture, and coneflower is another name for echinacea, and echinacea is identical phytocannabinoid to cannabis. So with that 100% with that prohibition and with absolutely no exemption for food, social, cultural, or ceremonial, and I've been doing indigenous hunting and fishing cases as well for 10 years, which, you know, combine these worlds, you see some opportunity. So really that's where we're gonna hold the government to account because if you look at the activity of seed propagation and cultivation and harvesting seeds and producing plants and medicine from that, Mark Miller, I mean, the former indigenous minister said that the First Nations people are the first agricultural innovators. So again, if you have connection with your land for 33,000 years, do you really think a white man government's gonna be able to tell you too much about what to do on your land when it comes to seed propagation? So we're hoping that we'll be able to establish an existing right. Now, if we can't, then we have other section or other charter defenses we're raising, such as Section Seven, Life, Liberty, Security of the Person, and yeah, that you're going to see a lot more cases. But look, I've droned on and on on that. Let me turn it over to uh, back to David. Thanks, Rob. Uh, much appreciated. Great response, Alan. I'm going to come to you. All. Certainly, if you wanted to comment on any of those, you're welcome to. But you see. Uh, in your day-to-day, -day, probably some things you'd like to fix, perhaps uh, some injustices that you see in the system that have consequences for people. Um, is there anything you'd like to say in terms of maybe describing some of those, your observations? That you could, maybe if you could, we asked the question earlier to the panel, if you could be in charge of the whole cannabis industry for 24 hours, and if you could fix anything you wanted, um, you know, what are some of the things that you'd like to see changed and, and, and justices that you may see right now? All right, well, excise tax, provincial markups, um, provincial listing at all. Um, <laughs> let's just see, packaging and labeling restrictions, promotional restrictions. Um, edible limitations. Edible limits and also packaging quantity limits um, are probably like the top just a handful literally out of my brain in five seconds. So the most impactful though, I would say is the provincial markup and excise com combined because you know, direct competition. is it your turn? No, no, but the direct competition. <laughs> um, yeah, so the provincial markups and you know, I actually disagree with one of the points that you made because eight store limits um, protect small retail chains because otherwise look at Alberta. We do not want 800 value buds in BC. Um, I think that we protect our small craft growers and our small homegrown retailers as best as we possibly can. And I think that actually dealing with the BC government is probably one of the most favorable to small independent farms. They certainly could improve. Um, as I mentioned, they take you know a markup on a tax which is your excise tax, and then we give it to the retailers and then they mark it up and we get tax on it again as a consumer. So I think that just an overall sense of less greed uh, from the governments and just everyone just take a little less and I think we can probably make a pretty big impact in this industry. And uh, you know, allowing us to do business without tying our hand behind our back and promoting ourselves at a 19 plus event, there's no reason that I shouldn't be allowed to hang a sign outside my campsite with my company name on it. 
this is me showing you where my farm is, but Health Canada doesn't like that. Or sorry, where my campsite is, but Health Canada doesn't like that. Um, so, you know, really the last thing I'll say about really improvements overall is we have five years of legalization and therefore they've got five years of data. Why are we still dealing with these consequences of these really fear-based policies and really not in any way data-based policies. And so from both a provincial and a federal level, I think I'd love to see some some really truly risk-based analysis on the five years of legalization that the sky did not fall. We, you know, no one died. Literally, I don't think anyone died. So there's that. <laughs> um, and versus many things, pharmaceuticals, are uh, probably a pretty big killer in the world. So let's uh, let's go over there. Excellent, thank you. Round of applause for our panel. Great uh, answers, appreciate it. I'm gonna check in with the crowd. Uh, you know, we're talking about consequences of legalization and I'm wondering if anyone has any stories that they wanna share before, or questions that you may wanna ask the panels. I've got one or two, but got great opportunity here. Anyone have a question or a comment? Be shy, Ellen. Yeah, uh, Harry, I'll give you the mic. You can say who you are. It's sort of more of a comment than anything else, but I have noticed as a lifelong toker <laughs> that since legalization, okay, before legalization, let's talk before legalization first. What was normal practice? You go to a joint and you light up. You go to a concert, I'm sorry, and you light up a joint. That was normal, right? It was just normal. Every concert, you that was just normal. Well, now, if you try the same thing, it's like suddenly there's cannabis police there. <laughs> what the heck is going on? And it's legal now. Like, it's just, it, there's been a whole weird culture change, and I don't even know what that's come from. Fear Any ideas? Fear-based policy. It's goofy. Lenny, you want to say uh, a comment on that? I was just saying it's, it's fear-based policy. It's people who have been told that cannabis consumers are bad, they are doing something illegal. You need to protect the world against them. And so therefore now they're like, oh, well, cannabis is legal, but like everyone that has been enforcing it for so long, they still hate us and, and the concept and they're still scared and they're, they still think that it's, it's terrible and evil. And that's really, we are changing it by banding together in associations such as the Craft Cannabis Association of British Columbia, the Retail Cannabis Council of British Columbia, the Craft Cannabis Co-op, all of those groups that, as you know, together drops a, in a flood. But the thing is, that's the problem, is that we are so fragmented as an industry that people from you know, the legacy side who are not yet transitioned or think that people who have transitioned made a big fuck up. They definitely think that. And so they don't want to like band together on the cause to improve. And, you know, sometimes producers against each other may not think that they're on the same side. And so no one's really banding together and the government's really kind of taking advantage of that disorganization. And so I think that even if you're not necessarily 100% sold on every single thing that an association might be doing, it's still putting your voice towards a greater cause of people who are trying to push change because me, you know, complaining to my friends on LinkedIn about the problems is really not doing anything. So engaging in those um, government survey things is, it seems lame, but it's, you can't not do it. Thanks, Elena. Great points. Kelly, did you want to make a comment? Um, well, I'm not from British Columbia, but I live here now. I'm from Ontario, and I can tell you that when we were working on legalization in Ottawa, um, the climate in Ontario and Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, not so much in Quebec, and then on the eastern coast, like it was very, very different, and there was very little access. Like we had maybe eight dispensaries that were very underground in Toronto, in Toronto, which is like the biggest city in Canada. So there was virtually no access for patients, let alone recreational, unless it was the black market, which was, you know, very fr uh, fragmented and 
Um, so it was very, so when I was working with activists in British Columbia, it was like constantly like, it's different in the rest of the country. Like what you guys are experiencing out here was so, We're so. experiencing going backwards a lot. Of, like what it feels, it like. feels like that, but for the rest of the country, it's like they don't have the stigma that they used to have. Like my sister was a suburban housewife. She could not smoke cannabis. It was so stigmatized. And it actually helped her in her health. We didn't have legalization back then. Now, people that need cannabis can just go to the store. We didn't have doctors that were giving licenses. Not like in this province. So, so I just, for me personally, I just, you know, British Columbia had a very different experience and continues to have a different experience. But for the rest of the country, I think, you know, we have to be, uh, well, I am personally thankful that that stigma is now less so. How's that? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Much appreciated. Great perspective. Anyone else want to make a comment? And thanks for the question, Ellie. Anyone else want to make a comment on consequences of cannabis legalization? Share a story. I'll come back to you. Rob, you talked a little bit about the Indigenous cases and something to watch. And, and trying to keep on the theme of the positive consequences, I think, you know, let's not forget about the lack of arrests and the things that you talked about. Um, you know, craft farmers feel shut out. Medical farmers who want to transition feel shut out. Indigenous people feel shut out. Um, we're all growing on uh, unceded territory. Do you see a potential consequence of legalization, those groups coming together more and uh, collaborating and maybe being a vehicle for something uh, positive in terms of reconciliation. Well, that's exactly what we're doing in the indigenous case because it's been four years that the clients have been strategically putting the pieces in place to be able to effectively bring the same traditional charter arguments. Uh, and we're hoping to have our case heard with Ted's case because they don't have an indigenous piece to their case and well, Corey doesn't have the 27 plus years experience of the VCBC operating compassionate access regarding edibles. But you're right, um, the coordination and collaboration has to happen. The difficulty though, regardless of the efforts that everyone's making, I think cannabis is so low a priority for government given the balance of everything else they're dealing with. And even just dealing with municipal bylaw issues, uh, unless you're on their ass, for lack of a better word, it's just like they will invent another reason not to, you know, or something else, or you got another requirement. So I mean, that's the difficulty is, I guess, some in an opportunity to develop some degree of uniformity between municipal standards, because again, it's like a total patchwork of different rules and regs. Some municipalities like Richmond and Surrey don't even have cannabis retail, right? So there's still a long way to go there. So this is really the trick is government. And then we've got the next two years an election cycle. So I think the next two years are a crucial period for groups like Kraft and BC Retail and, and everyone else to try to push these issues. But not everyone's going to be happy. So at the end of the day, if you've got an issue, it's really up to you to take it forward. I mean, there's no cavalry coming. If, it's, if you're not going to stand up for your own issue, no one else will. Um, and the other positive, I guess, challenge is that um, you, 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 can, you can talk about cannabis. Like, this is the thing in that, you know, you, you, you can all play a part, I think, in continuing to spread your message and call out bullshit because there is so much of it that comes from all levels of government unfortunately and I think there needs to be more accountability because for me what's weird is this is the same government that prohibited cannabis for a hundred plus years so wouldn't it be weird asking your abuser for more rights and permission so this is where at the end of the day I think more people need to stand up for and make the government accountable for the bad laws and decision making for the last hundred years as opposed to oh we can work with you now all's forgiven so I think there needs to be reconciliation on that front. And yes, this could all be part of a greater reconciliation strategy for the industry as well as for the traditional indigenous matter. Atlanta. 
I do want to say something about that. So I want to recognize the Kootenays for banding together as a, let's call you a region in this province and, you know, creating an alliance amongst what would be seen as competition. And I have a dream that every single major region in this province does the same. And so each region has, you know, their own sort of like small network of the people who are the helpers, you know, who want to push this forward. And then those helpers have their group of people that are just the ones that want to support them. You know, like my friends who are not in the cannabis industry, if I had a rally, let's say that every single person in this whole industry orchestrated by all of the different regions, all join forces to show up at all of our different MLAs and MPs. And, you know, we had a unified message and we would show them that we are the flood. And so all it's going to take is that grassroots efforts of all of you in your communities banding together and doing things like the Kootenays and the island, like we're trying to, um, to create that sort of network and build your own network. And if there's events, tell your people and we will together affect change because that's how it began. Here, here. Uh, questions or comments on the consequences of uh, cannabis legalization? Happy? Can you film and ask at the same time? Not if you stand in front of the camera. Uh, as many in the audience might know, there's a term called cents a million. It means it costs a few cents to grow, you sell it for a million. Now it costs a million to grow, it doesn't make any sense. But the best part of a good thing is that marijuana isn't $3,000 a pound anymore. I know we all love those days. But it's cheap enough that they make enough of it because they don't have to pay lawyer insurance, which is what they do between the doors, uh, that we can craft marijuana. You, if you're a little, little lady makes sab, you can't put in $2,500 for a pound of pot to make some knuckle cream. Mm -hmm. But that price has gone away. So it's basically, do we want to sell sawdust or do we want to sell toothpicks? And you can make a lot more by value adding to the product that is now available in much, much more larger quantities and much more ease and it's not so precious. I remember back in the uh, Expo 67, I'm sure some of you were there, yeah, sure. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I had a friend and he was kind of important because he had a friend who knew somebody with an ounce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We've come a long way. Now people come over to my house, they complain about buds on their socks. <laughs> so anyway, I'll pass this on, but I just want to tell you, there is a brighter future. Yeah. It involves tourists coming, and I think the answer was not should it be legal or legal. It's sort of like the Pollyanna. Is the glass half full or half empty? Let's fill it up. Yeah. So uh, they should make it, everybody try to the best of their ability to grow at least 10 plants. And then there'll be so much pot around, you won't be able to sell it, but you'll be able to give it away. And the tourists will come from all around the world to hunt the wild cannabis plant that they know is out there dropped by autos or helicopters by the tourist department. So and anyway, like peace, love, and joy. Like well said, Happy. Thank you very much. Free weed. No one's going to plot against that. Uh, on the tourism piece, I'm going to come right back to the audience. Alana, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, because this is cannabis tourism right now. Like you go up and down the street, there's license plates from all over the place. I'm sure the Salmo gas station's doing good business. Um, and I, I opened to the comment about just the, your leadership on, on tourism, uh, something that should be a no-brainer, really, uh, in many ways. Could you maybe speak about your... Are you all the way to your dream, or what are the obstacles to achieve something that should be quite uh, an obvious opportunity, and what, where do you think we should be going around cannabis tourism? Because it is something that does seem to unite everybody. People tend to agree that this is something real. Would you like to say a few things about that? Sure do. Cannabis tourism is probably my favorite topic, other than dabs. Um, so, cannabis tourism, the obstacles that we're facing are all really dumb things, honestly. I can't market myself online or even to other people uh, unless it's in a 19 plus event. So, I can market cannabis tourism to people in a bar. Um, the insurance element. Um, insurance, again, is a very risk-based 
concept and they have evidence and data, but it is not leveraged and used in their decision making. And so cannabis insurance for events is, uh, is quite expensive. Um, and so things like getting a bank account also are often at risk. Um, getting people to the farm, you often risk yourself getting uh, kicked off Airbnb sometimes or your Instagram account will get shut down. Um, I don't have the ability to sell product from my store or sorry, from my farm uh, unless I pay a application for a retail store that costs 13 times more of what a winery might cost. Um, so it's $550 if you want to open a winery, uh, $7,500 application fee if you want to open a weedery. Seems fair, right? Um, so that's definitely the element to my dream. The other element is that I want more than a cannabis retail store on my farm. I want a consumption lounge. I want to have a dab lounge that offers you an assortment of all of the different rosins from, you know, Vancouver Island or British Columbia. Um, I guess I should probably let the Kootenays in. They're pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> um, and I want to be able to sell pottery and farm fresh eggs and vegetables alongside my cannabis. And I want to be able to have infused coffees and, and cheesecakes that are fresh food. And I want to be able to um, have people consume my vegetables and my cannabis on my farm. Um, and I want to be considered agriculture. I want to be a farm stand. I want, I want the government regulations to allow me to do that and talk about it. Seems crazy, right? You were a radical. What a radical thought. My God. Um, thanks, Alana. And uh, just, I uh, had to ask you that question uh, being here. Any other comments people want to share? I'm going to wind down and maybe ask one or two more. But uh, um, again, anyone want to share stories, consequences of legalization? Right in the back, sir. I'll come to you. If you can just, sorry, say your name and uh, fire away. Hi, I'm Jeff. Does anybody else notice a shit ton of litter everywhere? Parks, trails, school grounds. There's nowhere, nowhere for anybody to consume, whether that's fine dining, you know, massages, vapor lounges, even uh, having a good ability to co, uh, you know, co-serve alcohol. And uh, cannabis, Kelly made a good point about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a no brainer. I mean, people that don't even like cannabis will think it's a good idea because then it's out of their sight, away from the stratas, away from parks, away from places you can't smoke. But, you know, just why, why isn't it a thing? Like, why do we always have to go to the underground? Why can't there be licensed, insurable establishments where you can put up on billboards a 19 plus event, like, you know, concerts and events at bars. But I mean, litter there's a shit ton of it there's a, a shit ton of stuff we can do with pardon pardon my language but it just like i love nature and i love trails like we have a ton of trails in coquitlam where i'm from and like cannabis litter is everywhere and even we clean up the trail less than a week later there's more packaging and then there's more packaging and joint tubes and mylar and it's crazy like it just like blows my mind that the the government is just ignoring that side of it Thank you for bringing that up. That's a great point. I hear that all the time. It just makes no sense. Um, Rob, can uh, I'm going to ask Rob, Rob one more question while we've got the lawyer here about medical access. The government keeps asking about this, uh, the consultation paper. They ask about medical access. They seem to be finding ways to restrict it. Um, you know, we're seeing examples where people had rights and then they lost them, rights that they thought they were always going to have. Um, do you think there's any, do you see any scenario whereby medical access rights are ever rolled back uh, in, in Canada? Or do you see any scenario where a future government could even roll back um, some of the elements of cannabis legalization? Well, thank you. Um, we just let, before I answer that question, you have to remember that cannabis is still very illegal internationally and under convention and the banking, accounting and financing 
is until that gets repealed and dialed back by the US government that led for effectively the international implementation of the controlled drugs and substances framework, or else we're limited, I mean, you were limited really to cannabis for scientific research and medical purposes. So trying to do all of these things until those important pieces are changed will be very difficult, which means our governments at all level, their hands are tied in what they can and can't do. So answering more to your question, um, which remind me it, please. Uh, are, are the medical rules yes. Well, an interesting conversation I've had with the conservatives that have reached out to me is they, they say, well, what should we do? And I'm like, why don't you give the provinces retail? Because at the end of the day, Section 9213 is provincial trade and industry. Section 91 is the medical program. So they, they want a strategy that I would not be surprised is the feds continue to manage the medical system, thereby dumping the cost of the administration and the enforcement and all of that other good stuff down on the provinces so they don't have to worry about it anymore. But there is a big risk that patient access rights are being attempted to be curtailed and clipped back. I mean, I was very surprised with the Toba Grow decision, for example, that Matt, was Toba Grow that was decided that they didn't have a right to home access, right? Yeah. And, and it was Quebec, yeah. It was, okay, yeah, no, that's right. So Quebec, and which I was surprised that given the jurisprudence and the clarity and the instruction from the Supreme Court from that litany of litigation, as Conroy calls it, that the Quebec courts came to that decision. Um, but I do see the biggest threat, if you will, to the legal medic or legal retail industry is folks growing under medical licenses. So I do suspect that in the interests of a market and protecting that market, steps will be taken, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on where your point is. But I do think the big licenses are going to get dialed back. You're going to actually have to demonstrate a serious medical condition as opposed to, yeah, I need a 500 gram a day license because I'm, I get a little bit of anxiety. No, like you're really going to have to demonstrate a little bit more of a need for that amount. And, um, I think there, there will be challenges because ultimately it was medical access that got us here. And I, again, unlike retail, recreational, commercial cannabis, there are no charter rights or guarantees around that activity. So I do think that by combining these medical issues with commercial retail considerations will give the retail market greater traction in their dealing with government than just trying to advocate for commercial change. So on that note, I'll hand it back. Lennon, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, so this isn't exactly to do with that, but it just made me think of something that uh, you brought up that elections are coming. So what we should be thinking of is not just to be campaigning it campaigning ourselves to who's in office now, but to be campaigning ourselves and what we are looking for to people who are prospective people in power and uh, even those surprise people that might not get into power. But if all of the possible candidates know what you want and are very specifically told, they want to win elections and things. So keeping that in mind that we shouldn't just be thinking of today, but we should be strategic in uh, what we're trying to do. <clears throat> Thanks, Elena. Great advice. I would encourage everyone, uh, you know, make sure you develop a relationship with your MP, your MLA, if you're licensed, uh, whichever government's giving you that license, develop a personal relationship with that elected official, mayors, councillors, you know, invite them to the ranch uh, to the degree that you can without losing your license, uh, and um, and uh, show them around and show them uh, who you are and because you are the, the face of the cannabis industry and it is a beautiful face. Uh, it's not the face we've been told uh, of what the cannabis industry is. So, uh, chance for closing uh, questions from the audience. I know you're listening intently. 
great, great responses. I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance to close off on a message of hope. Uh, what are you hopeful about uh, as we gather here, if we're so blessed to gather here a year from now, what do you hope has changed uh, the most in the next 12 months? Rob, start with you on that one and then we'll give Lana the last word. Sure. Well, I lived in Texas as a kid and there's an expression, wish in one hand, shit in the other and see what fills up first. Um, I'm expecting more of the same of that, um, which is positive, I guess, because there'll be a lot of opportunity to deal with these issues. I am positive that government eventually will get it right. But the difficulty for them, though, is, is yes, they have to win elections. And, you know, I meet with government. They ask for my views and so on. And, you know, for them, cannabis has to be seen as a more of a central issue, I think, for them to be more courageous in what they're prepared to do. But what is so great to see that in the last number of years, through David's efforts with the conferences that you've put on and the advocacy that you've been spearheading, the work that Kelly's been doing from the beginning and the activists and cultivators and participants that are all here, um, you know, it, it, it's exciting to see that there is a bright future in the ability to engage government on these issues. So if that, that continues to can grow, then I think the cannabis issues will be solved at a greater rate and hopefully on the international level. You know, the U.S. steps up and starts to try to back away federally on the controlled drugs and substances framework. It's at that point in time, really, that I be believe that that's when the industry can truly begin. Because until then, there's a risk that there's a lot of building on shifting sands because rules change. And I guess I'll sum up with a quote from the movie The Firm, which was really played well by Tom Cruise and Gene Hackman. And they're tax lawyers in the Cayman Islands walking on the beach. And being a tax lawyer is kind of similar to a cannabis lawyer because he says to Tom Cruise, hey kid, you know the best thing about being a tax lawyer is? And Tom Cruise is like, what? what, what? He goes, government changes the law, we advise our clients, government changes the law again. It's a circle of life. Well, that's how I feel as a cannabis lawyer, and I'm excited that the group and what the work that everyone's doing is advancing toward a, a more positive future for this industry. So I'll conclude there. Well, I was going to say a few more points of margin, but then you said 12 months, and who knows about that. <laughs> Um, but the thing that gives me hope for this industry is actually everybody here, honestly. Um, I look forward to, you know, and maybe it takes me longer than 12 months, but uh, accomplishing some of those dreams that I described to you all today. And I look forward to having many sessions over the next year with the rest of you. And honestly, just being, if they just let me promote myself a little bit more, that would be something that is truly good enough because I get to do what I love every single day. And I'm pretty fortunate that, uh, you know, making cannabis products and growing cannabis and smoking weed with all of you and t teaching people about dabs and giving them their first dab is what I get to do for a living. Like, I'll, I'll survive on uh, what little we get until it's, until it's better because we'll fight for it to be better. Thanks. Let's keep it going for all the panelists here. Great job, guys. Thank you so much. I'm sure they're very dry, and uh, I'm dying to smoke a doobie, so pull out the joints if you got them. I'm sure they'd love to see you. Come up and say hi, and, uh, and thanks to both of you for your leadership. Greatly appreciate it. Have a great rest of the weekend. And um, I'll stand by for the host to see what's coming up next, so stay tuned. There's always something coming. Stay, stay tuned. Just for the
Testing, testing.